much for that um, kind introduction and what a pleasure it is uh, to be here with you. Um, I am going to say that you must be quite a serious audience because I know you've heard from a number of economists and economics has been defined as the science of telling you things you've known your whole life but in a language that you can't understand. So I've written two books on economic history there, The Great Crashes and The Great Economist. So what I'm gonna do um, in, my, uh, in my brief time with you is actually try and learn some lessons from history. I'm gonna take the economic outlook, I'm gonna take a look at the short term, I'm gonna take a look at the medium term, and then I'm gonna take a look ahead to the longer term. And in each of these periods, I wanna see what history can teach us about taking advantage of the opportunities and mitigating some of the risks uh, which are on the horizon. And let me stress, there are opportunities. So I'm gonna give you a number of caveats. So here's my next caveat. Um, this is actually from uh, Mark Twain who said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. So no lesson will be perfect, but hopefully we can learn something from uh, what has come before. My second caveat is, I told you I'm going to take you from the short medium to the longer term, and if you get a little depressed in the short term, it does begin to look better in the medium to the longer term. But here's my caveat on that. And this comes from the great economist J.K. Galbraith who said, economic forecasting exists to make astrology look respectable. So we will do our best, but those are the caveats. So just firstly, return to the 1970s. So in the short term, of course, this is everybody's worry. So I know all of you in the audience are too young to remember the 1970s. So let me just remind you, it was a period like today of supply side shocks. So that means that inflation was coming from global factors and it meant it's very difficult for domestic economic policy to do much because most monetary and fiscal policy are actually geared at demand driven shocks and recessions. So, you know, normally in a recession, you want to cut interest rates. Um, however, if you have to contain inflation, you have to raise interest rates. And that's why this period is like the 1970s, where it is extremely challenging uh, to weather a supply side induced recession. So the 1970s uh, created a term called stagflation, a stagnant economy and double digit inflation, rising prices, not once, but twice in that decade. So how does today compare and what can we learn? The first thing to say is we actually have higher food prices today than we did in the 1970s. And that's because the source of the supply side shock in the 1970s were two wars in the Middle East, the Yom Kippur War in 73, 74, and the Iraq-Iran War in 79, which went on for a decade. Today, it's induced by the Russia-Ukraine War, and both those countries are actually major commodity exporters. So what that's saying is that there is a challenge because there's another avenue of inflation through commodities, and that's why core inflation, so this is when you strip out volatile items like food and energy, it's still well above central bank's 2% targets. There's a degree of stickiness as a result of this widespread um, source of inflation. So that being said, OECD countries um, experienced higher inflation and slower growth in the 1970s than they are today. In other words, it looks like, it looks like we might have learned some of the lessons from the 1970s, which is there is a limit to what economic policy can do. And especially monetary policy needs to calibrate very carefully, getting to a neutral rate that neither stimulates or depresses the economy, rather than, for instance, the Volcker shock of the early 1980s, which caused a deep global recession in the early 1980s. However, monetary policy systems, lots of differences um, from then compared to now. Um, however, I stress that as a result of hopefully having learned the lessons, you already begin to see prices coming down in a number of countries. So we are looking at a recessionary environment this year, um, but with prices beginning to moderate, um, hopefully uh, this will not be as bad as it was in the early 1980s. So in the short term, it's a period of uncertainty, limited 
um, economic policy tools, but I think hopefully the lessons have been learned. I want to move to the medium term. Now the lesson here is actually from the 1990s. So the 1990s uh, was characterized by lots of things, including um, a growth in uh, the computer age. And let me describe it as, I'm going to quote another great economist, Robert Solo, who said, um, you can see the computer age everywhere, except in the productivity data. He also said, the difference between giving my secretary a computer is that before she had one, she worked for me, and now I work for her. So this solo paradox is what we could potentially learn from the 1990s. There was a period in the late 1990s in the United States in which um, total factor productivity actually rose. And that's because, it sounds so obvious, firms actually changed the way they do business. They didn't just invent the technology, they used it. So I'm gonna ask for a show of hands if that's all right, which is how many of you use Zoom in 2019 before the pandemic? Okay, so we've got a few people. Um, they IPO'd before the pandemic, but we use that and other systems now, which changes the way we work because business practices have changed. So the technology was always there. So what are the medium term trends businesses need to look for in order to make sure you are ahead, you are the using Zoom in the 2019 uh, company looking forward? So the very first thing is changes in behavior. So um, workers have changed and the great resignation where lots of workers quit um, and tight labor markets is another difference between today and the 1970s. I'm gonna use a survey of US companies which actually said, if you were told by your boss to come back to the office five days a week, what would you do? So 57% would comply and return, 35% would return and then secretly look for a job on their computer at work, 6% um, would just quit. So that behavior, given how important people is, is certainly something to bear in mind. Now this I just find interesting. Um, what do people do with the extra time they, they no longer commute? Um, so most people, you'll be happy to see, actually work on their primary job. But if you look down there, just under 10% of people actually have a secret second job. That, and then looking at firms, this is coming back to my Zoom point. Um, you know, 72% of European companies, I'm taking different snapshots of different countries here, um, think that COVID, these trends will endure. So why don't they invest to make, um, to make the most um, of knowing these trends. So two things, uncertainty and availability of skills. Availability of skills requires training and government support. Uncertainty is the other lesson I want to draw. The end of the 1990s resulted in the dot-com boom and then bust. The companies that did best were the companies that kept a close eye on the bottom line and invested strategically because if you can do well in a downturn, you'll do really well in an upturn. And yet the tendency in a recession is just to cut back. And that actually is, 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 not, uh, is not the recipe for enduring a period of downturn. You need to look at these trends and invest and try to grow well, because what is inevitable is boom will follow bust and bust will follow boom. And then finally, as I say, in the long term, could we be facing another golden age? I'm gonna take us to the Asia region now. So the 1950s and 60s are known as the golden age of economic growth. Per capita incomes never grew as strongly as during that period. What drove it? It was the mass commercialization and the emergence of the middle class at that point in Western economies. We're seeing a similar trend now. So in, within a decade, for the very first time in history, more than half of the world's population will be middle income. Two thirds of them will be in this region, in Asia. 4.9 billion out of eight and a half billion people will make between 10 to $100 per day adjusted for what a dollar buys in their country. Do you know what the sign of a middle class person is? It's not a mobile phone, everyone has one. It's a refrigerator. So it means that you can afford consumer durables, it means you can afford services. 
So this tremendous adding of billions of people to the middle class centered in this region is potentially game changing. And COVID hasn't derailed that trend. And so to me, the longer term trend looks extremely promising. And the other one is globalization. So I want to make a big differentiation here. Goods trade have plateaued for years, but digital trade and services trade are growing exponentially. And the digitalization of everything offers huge opportunities, I would say, especially for India and for countries which are geared at services exports. And if you, another indication of this is the amount of data that's been consumed and stored. So the 21st century may not entirely be data, but it's going to be a lot of data. And the opportunities to um, recognize that and, uh, and make the most of it, um, I think, would help position your company for the longer term. So thank you. It literally says my time is up. I'm waiting for the buzzer. So I'm going to wrap up and say, I hope I've given you a sense that the short, medium, and the longer term holds massive amounts of opportunities. But hold on to your convictions. Know what your core offering is. Invest strategically. Watch the bottom line. And you will come out better, history says, um, than others who don't. Thank you very much for your kind attention.